I just hope I'm up uh, three holes on Larry when the Lord raptures. Yeah. What a wonderful blessing that will be. <laughs> yeah, not going to be any time soon. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You need to talk to Brother Larry now. I'm not, not, not going to boast in the flesh. You won't get to see it. That was even one. Well, I mean, yeah. All righty. Well, praise the Lord. Let's take the Bibles and turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Uh, the past couple of weeks, Brother John's been in Titus chapter 2, and that's where we'll be today, covering it from a little bit different spot. Titus chapter 2, and we'll read verses 11 through 15. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for another wonderful day of grace. We're thankful for the privilege that we have to come and assemble together with those of like precious faith. And as we do so, our prayer is to exalt and glorify and honor your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, should the Lord tell you, uh, for the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking into the event that uh, other than death, perhaps for the believer, uh, unfortunately, for the, holds much anticipation. Because we're looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then when we think about that, what's that going to be like? What's it going to entail? How's it going to be carried out? And many people have great anticipation uh, about it. But all the anticipation shouldn't be from any negative side. It should be all from the positive side. And as we think about that, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, I tell you, it will be a tremendous uh, event, and it will be a glorious event. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to come and to catch away the church, the body of Christ. You know, of course, this is talking about the event that most believers refer to as as the rapture. Uh, Rapture is not a Bible word, but that's the way that most people think about the glorious appearing. The Bible refers to it as the uh, blessed hope, as the catching away. And both those terms are going to speak to the fact of a a pre-tribulation, a pre-millennial return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We we understand what the tribulation is, that seven-year period of time when God pours out His wrath upon the nation of Israel, purging them, preparing them to go into the millennium, which is the thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, today there's some confusion, if you will, as to when the timing of the rapture will take place. But when we think about the glorious appearing and the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, it's with the idea and the understanding that we have been delivered from the wrath to come. And these terms are are not uh, either the catching away or the blessed hope or the rapture. They're not to be confused with what the Old Testament prophets wrote about. Old Testament prophets writing about prophecy. They were writing about an event when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return and come to the earth again. There are two advents or appearings of the Lord Jesus Christ according to prophecy. One was the first advent when he was born. The second one is the second advent when he returns back to this earth. And what will he do when he returns back to this earth? He's going to finish cleaning house and then he will, and then the kingdom will begin, will begin. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I'm, I often want to, when we come to see the word and, uh, I don't use it that often as, as it is, as some people do, and say, well, this could be two different events here. The blessed, the, the, uh, 
Yeah, it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glory. So it is the blessed hope, which is to say the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the one event when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come for the church, the body of Christ. So why should we think of the blessed hope and, and as a glorious appearing? Because this is what is our guarantee, that believers in the dispensation of the grace of God are, have been and will be eternally, forever, delivered from the wrath to come. That members of the church, the body of Christ, will not for any period of time, at any moment of time, ever be subject to the wrath of God being poured out upon man, as will be in the tribulation period. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Well, if we have, as a present possession, peace with God, for Him to punish us and to judge us during any part of the tribulation period would mean He would have to withdraw His peace. He is at peace with us, never based on our performance. It's all based on what was bought and paid for uh, 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 through the shed blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we will not for any reason be subject to any, uh, to be included in any part of the tribulation period if it's the first three and a half years or the second three and a half years. The scripture, the scriptures plainly teach that we look for the blessed hope of Christ's coming. And it is, if you will, because we have been delivered from the wrath to come. Come to First Timothy, I mean First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter one. First Thessalonians verses nine and ten. It says, For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I tell you, you know, uh, we want to, when we read the Scriptures, we certainly want to read them in light of who they're written to. And First Thessalonians was written to a church, member, a church which is a part of the church, the body of Christ. It said part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was, in fact, that he has, in a past tense way, delivered us from the wrath to come. And that, that's what makes it a glorious appearing. Anyone who understands what it's going to be like living in the tribulation period will think about the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ prior to the tribulation, delivering us from that wrath as a glorious event. And who's going to do it? The Lord himself is going to come and catch us away and take us to heaven to be with him for eternity. Come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's a lot of things that the Thessalonians could know. And uh, because they had act, uh, access, if you will, to the Old Testament Scriptures. There were some things, though, that the Thessalonians maybe weren't, uh, didn't have ac- access to or information about. And uh, one that, it's going to, that they're not going to have uh, information about is something which is completely unique, truth, Bible truth, uh, Pauline truth, which is uniquely uh, uh, true for the dispensation of grace in the church, the body of Christ. And he says in chap- 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verses 13 through 18, he said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words." The context here in First Thessalonians chapter 4 is it, it's got multiple prongs as it's going out, things that we can learn and things that we can, can hold to be dear and true. Evidently, we know there was some, some confusion about the resurrection that was going on in, uh, in Second Timothy, as those who, and even in Titus, uh, uh, confused about the fact, had the resurrection already taken place? Had, uh, had, had some people missed it? And there's some confusion going on about those who, who died before the Lord came back. Could they possibly be able to 
spend eternity in the Lord, or were they going to uh, be, uh, take part with the rapture, or were they going to miss that? But Paul wants to be uh, to for everyone to rest assured and to know for sure. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. He says in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Who would, who would be the one who didn't have any hope? People who wouldn't have any hope were those who say, Well, I have no hope of being able to see my loved ones in eternity again. I have, I have no hope uh, and, uh, and security or peace of mind because I don't know what's going to happen to them if they died before the Lord returns for the church, the body of Christ. There wasn't any confusion, really, as in their minds about the, the Lord coming back for them. It is the confusion that was, that was reigning through Thessalonica uh, there was um, in Thessalonica had to do with if you died before the Lord came back. And Paul says, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I don't want you to be worried about this. I don't want you to spend any time as, uh, and, and worry about those who have no hope, as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Isn't that comforting? We don't have to get to verse 18 to say that's a comforting verse right there. Because he says, if you just simply believe the gospel... How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. And how that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. If you believe that He died for your sins, it doesn't matter, dead or alive. He says, when the Lord comes back, we're going to be part of His. And He says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He says the only thing about it is those who are dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. At the same time, same event, on the same day, in the same moment, in the same twinkling of an eye, we're going to be united uh, in, in, uh, in glory in heaven with all those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ in the dispensation of grace. Paul had a great desire that the Thessalonians would not be ignorant. He didn't want them to be unlearned or unknowing about a special truth concerning the dispensation of the grace of God. He said it's the he says that he talks in, in Titus about being the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He says in here in Thessalonians he talks about being caught away and caught away. I mean, the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, shout with the voice of the archangel, and uh, take us to be at home with the Lord. Paul makes a bold statement here in verse 14 and 15. He says, "For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also." which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. People perhaps would, would question as they were learning this doctrine that was being committed to them through the Apostle Paul, and they'd want to know, Paul, why are you saying to this? How can you say this? You know, Paul said in Ephesians that, that the things, that the, what he was teaching were the unsearchable riches of Christ. They didn't exist. You know, you can't find the truth about the pre-trib rapture of the church in prophecy. You can't find it from Isaiah. You can't find it from Ezekiel or Daniel or Hosea or Joel or Amos. You can't find it from any of the Old Testament prophets. You know why? It's not there. It has nothing to do with them. And it would be inconsistent to believe that they would have anything to say about the pre-trib rapture of the church. They have a, another message. So here's Paul saying this, and they would say, I can hear people say, scoffers say, well, Paul, why are you saying this? How can you say this? And he says in verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Simply put, the Lord said, Paul, this is what I want you to tell the church, the body of Christ, about the catching away. This is what Paul didn't want the Thessalonians to be ignorant of. But you know, some 2,000 years later, much of Christianity is still confused about when the rapture is going to take place. And you know why they're confused about it? Because they're trying to figure out how it relates to prophetical events. And how does it relate to prophetical events? It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't relate to a prophetical event. As we've studied many times, even and, and much of the confusion, as we've studied many times before, comes from the fact that there are people, even before Paul... Uh, died, 
and was cast into prison in Rome, people were just departing from the truth that he had been preaching. Come to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, give heed, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. What was the urgency? Why would Paul have to, have to take the time and in an urgent manner Charge Timothy to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. It's because people were teaching other doctrines. It's because that there was a battle raging in Ephesus over the things that were taught uh, uh, to us, to, to the church, the body of Christ, or taught to Timothy by the Apostle Paul. There was opposition. So even before Paul left, leaves Ephesus, his ministry and those that are involved in and around his ministry, there's conflict and there's battle for who is going to preach and to teach what. So, why charge some that teach no other doctrine? Because there is a tendency among believers to depart the truth that the, that, uh, the Apostle Paul taught. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared, with a hot iron. We understand what they were teaching. He says, the Spirit speaketh expressly. No misunderstanding what the Spirit's going to be teaching us now. He says that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. You know, no wonder the Apostle Paul thought he was living in the latter times when he was still alive. Why? Because people were departing from the faith. They were departing from that message and that doctrine which was committed to him for the church, the body of Christ. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. He said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to, to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto, unto fables. You know, they're going to reject the truths that, that uh, they learned from the Apostle Paul. So early on in Paul's ministry, believers were dropping like flies. They were departing in droves. And instead of wanting the truth as taught to them by the Apostle Paul, they had a group of doctrines and understanding that, that tickled their ears, they had itching ears. They wanted to hear not what Paul had to say, but what they believed would be uh, the best for them. First Timothy chapter four and verse one again. It says, "I charge thee before." First Timothy chapter four and verse one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Verses nine, ten, and uh, and eleven. He says. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. These things command and teach. He says, stay true to the things which you have learned, uh, which you have learned of me for sure. So they come along and they are departing from those things which uh, the Apostle Paul identified and that was uniquely given to the church, the body of Christ. And the trend to depart from the truth concerning the church, the body of Christ, continues even to this day. We can see it all around it. I mean, you don't have to look hardly at all. All you do is to turn on the uh, television or turn on the radio and listen to the messages that are being preached. And they're almost void of Pauline truth. They're almost void of that unique uh, and distinctive ministry about the church, the body of Christ. And therefore, mass confusion uh, reigns. And this needs doesn't need to be. You know, people look at, the, at God's Word and they say, you know, God's Word is so hard to understand. You know why it's hard to understand? 
Because you don't rightly, we don't rightly divide it. If we just rightly divide the word of truth, it's not hard to understand. In fact, it's crystal clear. Sometimes they think God, the master communicator of all, of all the universe, it has trouble communicating to us what he wants us to know. Well, that's just not true. It's we don't use his book in the way that he said to use it. That's what makes it confusing. And so all the uncertainty uh, of when the church, if, when, or even if the church will go through the tribulation uh, is answered fully when studied dispensationally. The issue of the rapture is a dispensation. You know, God is, uh, and when he wrote his word, he was clear not to mix and to mingle the programs. And what is the uniqueness of the, of the message for the, the church, the body of Christ today in the dispensation of grace? It's called the mystery. And it was a secret that was hid in God till the time, till the time was, when the time was right. You know, there are three different thoughts on the, on the, the church and the, and the tribulation. First is called the pre-trib, meaning the rapture will take place before the beginning of the tribulation. That's what we believe. Second is, the, is called the mid-trib. And some have modified this today to, uh, to represent truth, saying that the, that the church, it's a pre-wrath rapture. It's just a modified mid-trib, sometime in the middle. And then the post-trib, which says the church isn't going to be raptured at all, that they'll go all the way through the end of the, uh, of the tribulation. So who's right? Well, if you rightly divide the word of truth, the evidence becomes clear. The answer is we can know, and we can know for certain who is right. We can know this just as sure that, that we know that we have eternal life. We can know that the church will not go through the tribulation, any part of the tribulation, just as sure as we can know that all of our sins have been forgiven. We can know this because the tribulation is the subject of prophecy. The rapture is the subject of the mystery. The truth of the day is called the mystery. The blessed hope of being delivered from the wrath to come is only found in our Bibles from Romans through Philemon, which makes it the subject of of uh, the dispensation of grace. The issue in understanding when the Lord will come for us is in recognizing the uniqueness of the information that was delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. You know, without, without having Romans through Philemon, we would not have any hope of being delivered at all from the wrath to come. Those post-trib uh, rapturous only put the church in there as the rapture at the end of it because Paul wrote about it, but they don't make the distinction at all. But the truth is, you take Romans to Philemon out, then you would have all believers of all ages going through all seven years of the tribulation period. No hope with deliverance at all. So we look at that and we see what's being taken, what's taking place and why the confusion comes. Without Romans to Philemon, we would not have any reason to believe that we wouldn't have, that we will not go through the tribulation. You know, traditionally it's believed that the church, the body of Christ, began with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. That's the first big mistake. <laughs> because if you do that, you're going to have to concede the fact that the church is going to have to go through at least part of the tribulation. Come back to chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we'll read verses 1 through 6. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confused, confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. We understand what's going on here in, the, in Acts chapter 2. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had commissioned his disciples to have a worldwide ministry beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And they are taking away the curse of the tongues of tongues that uh, was uh, put upon mankind at the Tower of Babel. They would now be free, and as they would go speaking in their own languages, they would be understood in the language that the person knew that they were speaking to. Every man heard them in their own language. Well, is this the subject of Pauline revelation, or is this going to be the subject of what the prophets had to speak? Look at verses 14 through 21, Acts chapter 2, 
verses 14 through 21. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon in, into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Well, when's the sun going to be uh, turned into darkness, and when's the moon going, going to be turned into blood? Before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Well, so that's going to be sometime right before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. This passage, if it will, divides the first half of the trib from the second half of the tribulation. But the fact is, it is the subject of prophecy. He said, this is that which was spoken by the, by the prophet uh, Joel. So, which is, uh, you know, we look at in verse 20, of course, as we were reading it, and it's speaking of the last days of prophecy, not the latter times or what Paul would consider the last days of the dispensation of the grace of God, but it's going to be the last days of prophecy. You know, what are, what are the last prophetical, of, what is the last prophetical event of prophecy? Tribulation. And then that's what it's going to be, because once the tribulation is completed, they kind of step off out into what, uh, into the millennia, if you will. They're going to be, he says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. So if we're reading this and we want to know what is Peter really speaking about, we don't turn to Romans through Philemon. What we do is we turn to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Joel chapter 2. Verse 28 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered uh, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Well, who's the remnant? Well, we know that's going to be the, the little flock. And this is though that's who, that's who God is going to work with, and they will be the authority in the nation during the, uh, the millennial reign. So Joel, no, nowhere do we find that Joel says that they've been delivered from the wrath to come. Know what Joel just says, get ready because it is coming. This is that. Peter says, this is that which Joel uh, spoke of. And, and, uh, and Joel, when you read what Joel says, he says, get ready because there's no way for you to escape. So why is Paul's message different? Well, Paul's message is different because he did not get it from Joel. He didn't get it from Peter. He says, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. He got it and he received it directly from the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Well, he says how that by revelation he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was it by revelation? Well, because when Paul, when the, when the Lord spoke to Paul, he was no longer on the earth. He had to speak to Paul by revelation. And he gave him a unique truth, something that Paul never received from man. Come to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. It said, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation 
of Jesus Christ. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. Now, how many men would that apply to? All men. There are no, he, he did not receive it from Joel. He didn't receive it from Peter. He received it from, only from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, and uh, so come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I've often tried to read Joel. I've often tried to read Acts chapter 2 even and come to find out how there could be words of comfort when you're facing the outright pouring, outright pouring of God's wrath. As we learn in other places, it's pouring out His wrath without mixture. Without mixture of what? <laughs> Grace. <laughs> Anything. It's just pure wrath. Unadulterated wrath being poured out upon all, uh, all of, uh, of mankind. So who gave Paul permission to say these things? Well, of course, it's going to be God himself. He's going to say that. In, uh, in verses 15 through 17, we have the information concerning, if you will, uh, how believers of this age will be united with the Lord. What's the one element? What's the one piece of this information, though, that's missing here? And it's the question that's rung out through eternity and whatever age that, that man lived. Everybody wants to know, when is the truth for me going to happen? In Matthew chapter uh, 24, the, the, the disciples came to the Lord and they wanted to know, when will this take place? When will the kingdom be set up? And when will the kingdom come? And it's not, it's not for us to know when. So we come along, we see the, and, uh, uh, the question about when is missing. When will the Lord come for us? For that, there is no answer. All we can do, then, is separate mystery truth from prophecy. So we won't be confused. Notice how Paul does this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, he said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. There's some doctrine of which he says, I don't want you to be unlearned about. But now notice how the... Thou the uh, the, uh, the, the information changes, if you will, or the scope changes in chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. He says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. How could they be ignorant of one truth, but know perfectly about something else? Because the truth about the catching away of the believer was new. It was not prophecy. It had not been talked before until it was revealed by the Apostle Paul. But that's not true about prophecy. Because he says, and when he talk about but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Well, that's a, that's a phrase and a term which is tied to the prophetical return of the Lord Jesus Christ to, to the earth. The word but is a dis, uh, disjunctive, and but places things into contrast. But what are we contrasting here? We're contrasting the truth about the catching away of the believer with the truth about the day of the Lord. Paul's going to show how it's different. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, But the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. Go into verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. The contrast is going to be the contrast between uh, the catching away of the believer with the day of the Lord. The contrast in chapter 5 is between they and ye. They who are going to be part of the day of the Lord and those, the ye, the Thessalonians, who aren't going to be part of that. He says, but ye, brethren, are not, verse 4, are not in the darkness that they should overtake uh, take you as a thief. 
You know, the contrast moves from, once again, from the catching of the wave to the difference between the thee and the, the ye. Pick up verse 3, and we'll go down through verse 9 now. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Why? For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. By our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And, of course, verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Well, the contrast between who Paul's talking to and who knows what, is, it's, uh, it's striking as we come down through chapter 5. He says, Those people who are of the night are not part of you. Only the children of the day and the children of the light, they are the ones who have been delivered from the wrath to come. He says uh, in verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. To obtain salvation from what? Well, salvation from the wrath. <laughs> Guess who? If, if uh, we have and they haven't, then the reverse would be true. They haven't been uh, delivered from the wrath to come. They haven't obtained salvation. They, they have, in other words, they have been appointed unto wrath. And that's what prophecy has certainly taught over and over again. When Christ comes with a shout, he's going to come and he's going to meet us again in the air. He's going to meet us in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Once again, we are not appointed unto wrath. And the reason is because we've been delivered from the wrath. The believers at Pentecost in Acts 2 were never given any hope of being delivered from, uh, from the wrath to come. They were instructed on how to survive the wrath. That's what Hebrews and uh, through Revelation is taught. Giving the believers and arming the believer, if you will, with the information that they will need to survive uh, the tribulation. You know, we need to be careful as we approach the Scriptures, watching closely for the details of passages. There are several passages of Scripture that, that believers today have just tripped up over because of not rightly dividing the word of truth. Come to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And let's read verses 40 through 42. It says, Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But you know what? When we come along, we read this passage of Scripture. If all we read were verses 40 to 42, we could think, you know, well, that kind of sounds a little bit like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord's going to ascend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then what happens to everybody else? They remain. So when we read Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 to 42, without putting it in context, we could think that they're talking about the same thing. But we're going to find out we're not. Because what is the context, if you will, of verses 40 to 42? Well, let's back up into verse 36. Verse 36 to 38. It says, but of that day and hour know no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, in verse 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field. Well, if we want to understand Matthew 24, it's imperative that we understand uh, the flood. Come to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, verses 16 through 23. 
And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him, and, uh, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth, and the waters prevailed and, the, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the water. And the water prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole earth were covered. Fifteen cubic feet upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of the of fowl and of cattle, and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in, uh, in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping thing and the fowl of heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the, in the ark. Well, it's a pretty revealing passage. Remember Matthew 24 says, Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And it's going to be just as it was in the days of Noah. If we compare this, who was taken and who was left? Well, those that were taken are, were definitely taken in judgment, weren't they? Those that were left was Noah and uh, and those that were in the ark with him. They remained alive. They were the ones that, that made it through. The judgment didn't pour out upon them. Taken was taken in judgment. And uh, Noah and all those that were with him in the ark, they lived. So what happened to the ones that were taken? Well, look at verse 21 and 22. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of the fowls and of the cattle and of the beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, they died. Well, would you consider that a blessing or a curse? If you died because of the flood, then you would probably think that that's judgment and that's curse. And that would be, that would be exactly right. They perished in the flood. So they were taken in judgment. But no one, those that lived, they, those that were on the ark, they were left they were the ones that were truly left behind, if you will. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verses 13 through 18. And it came to pass in the 600th and the first year, in the first month, and the first day of the month, the waters were dried up upon the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth out of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of the all flesh, both of the fowl and of the cattle and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and fulfill and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Well, what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like once the ark, once those that were uh, left behind, ones that remained, God says, this is where we pick up with the commission that I gave to, uh, to Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish the earth, and to subdue it. Come back to Matthew chapter 24. Sometimes I feel as we go through this that we, we end up belaboring this point a little bit. But I, I tell you, I've talked to many people over the years, and uh, what seems to be an obvious comparison to Genesis and Matthew sometimes escapes uh, some that we're, that we're talking with because it's as if they don't get the connection between those that are taken were the ones that, that died, they, and the ones that remained were the ones that lived. And if that's true, then we can understand Matthew 24, verse 36 through 42. It says, But of that day and hour know no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Well, it's, we see the comparison here. Now come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because we see that it's completely opposite. 
in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, we look at that and we see that that when the Lord comes back, He takes the ones that He takes, that's us. And we, we get the blessing. The ones that left, the judgment is going to pour out, going to be poured out upon them. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony uh, among you was believed in that day. So, those that are caught up to be with the Lord in the air... They get the blessing. Those that are left are going to get the wrath and the vengeance of God poured out upon them. You know, we think about the nation of Israel, and the truth is, the nation of Israel never anticipated leaving this earth. The prophets never told the nation of Israel there was going to ever be a time when the Lord would come and catch them away and take them to be in heaven with them. They were taught to expect that God would send His Son back to the earth and to set up a kingdom, and they would remain on the earth forever. They were never expecting to meet the Lord in the air. And the reason why, because that was mystery truth. The prophets never told them anything about what Paul spoke about. Israel was taught to expect Christ to come and to live in their midst. Isaiah the prophet promised them a sign. He says, uh, you'll have a son, uh, be born of a virgin, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And they were expecting for God to send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, back to the earth to be with them. And even after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, come to Acts chapter 2, even after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, there was still hope of the kingdom. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. He says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. You know, for the nation of Israel, it was good news that even though they had the Lord Jesus Christ killed, that uh, God raised him from the dead. But you know what? There's even better news for them. That's verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that as the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Israel, Peter saying to Israel, the kingdom is still an option. The kingdom is still in play, if you will. After Christ's resurrection, he spent, if you will, 40 days with his disciples. It says he, spe- he spent 40 days with them, teaching them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He's been teaching them about things about when the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was teaching them about the things that were going to take place when he came back to this earth. Because he's going to leave. Look at Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. It says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall, so shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. 
around verse 12 says, Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. You know, they were they asking in verse 6, Well, thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel. He'd been teaching them, and they, they thought it was going to happen right now. Next thing you know, he ascends back into heaven, and they're standing there. Well, what does all this mean? And the two men of white apparel say, Listen, don't be alarmed, because he's going to come back just as he left. And he is, if you read the book of Zechariah, Zechariah says that when he comes back, his feet will land right on the spot where he left, right there on the Mount of Olivet. So the disciples, they were going to be witnesses. That's what verse 8 says. You should be witnesses of me. But what are they going to be witnesses about? Well, the resurrection, of course, but also a witness of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. Come to chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he, that's God, shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive into the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So what is it that they got? They're going to be witnesses of the fact that Christ will come again, and he'll come back to the earth. We have the first advent at his birth. We have the second advent at uh, the second coming of Christ to the earth as according to, uh, to prophecy. So clearly they were expecting Christ to come back, but they were expecting him to come back to the earth, but not us. Today we look for the Lord to come and to take us away from this earth to take us to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Come back to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. 11 through 15. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. We'll pick up here next week. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the, the truth that's unique to the age in which we live. We thank you for the promise of being delivered from the wrath to come. We, we thank you for the promise that the Lord himself will come and catch away members of the church, the body of Christ, and to take us to be with him for eternity in heaven. And uh, we give you the praise and honor and glory for the testimony of, of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Number 76. Christ is all that he claimed to be. I'm so glad that he lives in me. My hope of glory, yes, he is. For he is mine and I am his. Hey, Amen. Thank you all for coming today. Certainly look forward to uh, having you join us on Pal Talk tomorrow night. And we want to thank each and every one of you all for coming and being part of our study today as well. And uh, we look forward to maybe seeing you tomorrow night, 7 p.m., Grace Bible Studies, and that's on Pal Talk. Praise the Lord.